Hello, everyone, and welcome to From the Ground Up podcast. So we're going to have an amazing podcast for you today. But first, I would like for you guys to check out the Madison Area Herpetological Society and the benefit that's going on that is benefiting forest fanning. So please go check that out. Um, there are a bunch of things going on right now and a bunch of items that are up. So uh, yeah, give it a gander for sure. It goes obviously to a good cause. And also, I want to mention the fact that it's St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day to all of our folks out there. And I guess if you're not Irish, you're Irish today, right? That's the that's a cliche. But, but also, um, we're working on day four of quarantine. So this is fun. I haven't talked to anyone in probably four days. So this will be a much needed conversation. And I think our guest is kind of on the same page as well. We were already talking this morning or that, not this morning, just before. But uh, so, yeah, I'll be pumped to get my uh, social interaction via the video interwebs. But also, if you guys want to check out, please, portcitypythons.com or portcitypet.com. They both go to the same place. And I have some isopods available as well as some reptile supplies, aspen bedding, cocoa chip. Coco core, all that good stuff. So uh, if you guys want to check that out, we're also going to have some springtail food as well as isopod food and uh, isopod calcium and stuff like that uh, coming up. So I'm really pumped about that. Other than that, that's all I'm really, uh, that's all I really got for you guys. I mean, it's nice to, as a reptile keeper, I think we are not, it's not that far out to think that uh, we're quarantined and we don't need to socialize for, for a little bit. I think it's uh it's nice to just be locked in the house with our animals sometimes. So I hope you guys are having fun with that. Uh, otherwise, our guest today, he wrote Passionate Journey with Short Tail Pythons, as well as he has worked with the Chicago Herpetological Society, as well as uh, animal rescues in his area, reptile rescues. And it's really my pleasure to have on Rich Crowley. Rich, thank you so much for being on. Oh, thanks for having me on. Of course. So how did you first get interested in reptiles? Oh, wow. So it's going back quite a long time, but I've got family that actually is uh, down in Southern Illinois. And as a kid, we used to visit them a couple times a year. And I had the opportunity to uh, travel along Snake Road and the other Herp Wonder sites down in Illinois. And that experience really kind of um, fueled my already uh sort of insatiable appetite for getting involved with animals. Uh, it extended not only into reptiles and amphibians, um, but also into invertebrates. And actually I was probably into invertebrates long before I ever got into herps. So uh, I did all sorts of goofy stuff when I was a kid, bringing things home. And um, I was not allowed to have snakes as a kid. Um, my first snake that I ever caught that I was actually able to sort of keep was back when I was in, I think it was like fifth grade, we kept it in the science room and the thing eventually got out. So it was my first captive caught snake and it was my first rescue because I heard a shrill shriek about two hours later and had to recover the snake from its uh, from its place in the uh, band room at the time. So yeah, it's been, it's been fun. And of course I've ramped up and made up for my lost time as a snake keeper. Oh man, Are, were you a kid that had like an ant farm in their room and everything? Oh man, uh, I had uh, walking sticks, praying mantis. I had probably at least six or eight different species of uh, spiders, native you know North America, uh, wolf spiders and uh, the orb weavers and stuff like that. Um, I actually kept crawfish, um, and I was big into catching catching the animals at times when they were actually like reproducing. So I would catch the crayfish when they had the babies. I would um, I actually uh, came across a Cecropia moth actually laying eggs in a bush next to my house and, and raised the entire um, patch of eggs up until they were in the larval state and you you know metamorphosis. So I've done some you know I've had some really weird experiences. Uh, toads and stuff like that used to keep, um, and it wasn't really until I got into college that I was able to just basically put uh, uh, put everything aside and say, hey, I'm going to get a snake. And that experience actually taught me a lot. It was not a successful experience. And it was because it was not successful. And I was uh, tenacious and trying to learn as much as I could that it kind of eventually uh, led to where I'm at today. 
Yeah. So kind of what was that first experience and was it exotics right off the bat or were you working with North, something North American? Uh, it was uh, the first actual snake I ever bought. It was not the first snake I ever kept, but the first snake I ever bought was a ball python. I paid like $75 for an imported adult ball python. And I want to say it was like 1988. Um, the animal actually uh, did not eat for me for the 11 months I had it until it had to be euthanized. And the reason it didn't is after spending um, several hundred dollars of veterinary uh, charges, uh, we found out it actually had decomposing food material inside of its gut and its uh, lower um, tract was um, necrotic. So um, just before I uh, left for spring break, the uh, snake had to be euthanized. And I left this set up and the timer's going while I was gone on spring break and never told my mom I actually uh, disposed of the animal um, in a euthanasia. And uh, I got a call, I think about four or five days later, my mom figured out that Monty was not in his cage. <laughs> so yeah, I was, uh, I was kind of a little bit of a stinker to my mother on that one. Um, so she let me keep snakes after that, but I don't think I really reclaimed the uh, ownership um, right and privilege until really uh, a few years later when I actually moved out on my own after college. And were you still interested in ball pythons at that point? You know, it was um, the first snake I ever fell in love with was a, a, your classic OKT style uh, corn snake, which at the time was the same time I, I bought the ball python. And the corn snake was something like $190. And I was like, poor college student refusing to spend the money, I ended up spending much, much more than that on the veterinary costs. But um, I actually um, was not really focused on ball pythons at that stage. It was the only thing available, really. Um, I wanted things that were a little bit bigger, and I want, but I was a little bit more practical about it. So I focused on um, later years getting into more colubrids and then kind of worked myself back into doing it properly. And uh, at the time, I had my, my wife and we were both aquatists, uh, our aquarists keeping different types of uh, freshwater fish. And we just, we both had snakes growing up as kids. It was just while we were dating, we came across a chance of buying a pair of uh, diamondback water snake uh, juveniles. And <laughs> not Sounds the best thrilling. experience. Yeah. <laughs> they were, I got mine to tame down. My wife did not get hers to tame down, but they were the meanest. They were, well, I should say they were the most stressed snakes because I don't believe they're mean. But um, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Uh, it was also probably the first, first in, I want to say almost only uh, snake I've actually rehomed uh, oh. where I owned it. Yeah, um, I, I'm committed to the animals I take in and I will keep them unless I'm acting as a steward to rehome rescues I've taken in. Um, so yeah, kind of, and it just steamrolled from there. Um, I, I got, that, that was early on. Uh, my wife had grown up with a boa constrictor. I had, the, of course, the ball python and I had that were um, housed elsewhere. They're animals. Um, but as we started purchasing, um, going to shows and seeing things that we liked, we started building up our collection. And, uh, you know, I dragons in um, California. Um, I had a brown basilisk that my wife actually got me for my birthday. And she did the full, she bought it like a month ahead of time, set up this complete uh, naturalistic setup. Um, and, and that went for a while against newbie mistakes and come to parasite infection and stuff. Um, but Every time I uh, went into things and didn't have enough information, um, I went back to a little bit back to the drawing board to teach myself about what it was that um, I didn't do right um, or where I wanted to have more knowledge. Because um, there were a few things I did, I felt like I did very well or have been doing very well with certain species. You're always learning, um, you're always. Um, experiencing something new, um, something that you're not entirely equipped with um, in the beginning. And I think uh, over time, I've gotten to be aware enough that I try to hear from other keepers 
and try to sort of um, record and store all that knowledge as best I can. And I probably pay better attention to reptiles than I do in my day job, but uh, <laughs> both <laughs> of them can be all. equally complex. Yeah. Um, so, but it really wasn't until I, th I want to say uh, it was about 25 years ago when um, I happened to chance on one of the first um, Chicago Herpological Society Reptile Fest events. And I was just, floored that all these people kept all these different species and for me i was um immediately you know captivated by what these people were doing and actually talking to other people they kept it and um picking their brains and it it's funny because ironically many of those people that i met at that first show um i'm still friends with to this day and couple names might pop in. I mean, uh, Ty Park was there with his bearded dragons back when he was raising them. Wow. Um, and some of the staff that he had working for him at the time, and I got exposed to Euromastics, like the Ornatus and uh, definitely the morphs of the bearded dragons. And um, I think my birth, my first bearded dragon uh, morph that I purchased ended up being from uh, Bob Mayu um, and Philippe Fajoli went back in those days um it was a same fire dragon ranch so it was about me you at the time um so yeah it was it was it was pretty cool to go through all that and i've been active member of the herp society ever since um i've been out of the last 25 years i've been president for um i just had to step back after being on the um in the president's chair for the last three years I think my wife was ready to divorce me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, she probably would have killed me first, but uh, you know, <laughs> she was missing me. Um, but yeah, so I mean, what is the as far as doing as far as doing research and stuff? I mean, before the the Herb Society, what were the resources? Because I mean, now we're used to whether it was forums a few years ago, or now there's Facebook groups and YouTube mm -hmm. videos, all that stuff. I mean, how are you getting this research and uh, you um, know, finding out how to keep these animals? Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been kind of a knowledge junkie for a long time, and um, it started my my literary experience started with uh, a complete set of the Audubon encyclopedias from a family member back when I was probably like ten or eleven years old, and that was my first experience into um, really having access to a body of knowledge and and being able to explore it everything from the beautiful imagery that the Audubon um, publications have to all the res the knowledge of the native habitat and that. And I loved it all. Um, later on, it ended up being, I don't know if anybody who's been around long enough, remember the old university listservs where you actually had to dial in and you had that squawking telephone dial and you'd post something and like a week later, you get a digest back of responses. <laughs> um, <laughs> a week. Uh, okay. So um outside of that it was you know sending you know via snail mail a letter to somebody and saying hey i'm looking for some information i was told you're the uh you're the person to talk to um and i remember oh my gosh i i want to say it was doug Dix with uh with the Euromastics. i was getting into Euromastics a long time ago and i wanted to learn everything there was about them and uh we've had really a lot of fun with the Euromastics over the years um not so focused on breeding them, but it was just fun to keep them. And, um, but, uh, you know, going from one species to another, it was, you know, I, my problem is I got like this ultimate reptile ADD. I keep going to getting drawn to different species. And um, the, the interesting part is out of all that, the one thing that has stuck with me is, as you can see over the, over my shoulder, is the short-tailed pythons have been probably the longest surviving love I've had for um, any reptile species specifically. Um, you know, even though I tease the ball pythons were my kind of, they weren't even a love. They were my first infatuation. Uh, my first love was the short tails and it continues to be. And, uh, and yet I still have ball pythons and they'll probably be my last love the way they live. Uh, the short tails were the ones that were the most mysterious to me. And, you know, back when I first saw my first one in 93, I think it was, 94, um, I wanted to have them. And so how did you get your hands on, you know, your first one, and what was it? Uh, which species was it? Uh, it was Python Breedensteini. Um, it was the Borneo Python. Um, I had made the mistake 
uh, with a friend who was in the reptile trade, who was actually um, kind of a pet trade, a pet store importer. And I said, man, I'm really looking for a blood python. And he goes, oh, I can get that for you. And he ends up getting me this um, brown, um, not very well patterned uh, Borneo. And I was like, man, it's not what I had in mind, but it's like, wow, it's fat. It's kind of got this cute little chubby face and a short little perky tail. Um, and it was extremely mellow. Um, it was not traditional to what people usually associate with short tails with that old import, you know, aggressiveness. Um, and I, I love that. I mean, it was, a, it was a great Borneo to have. Um, and then from there, I started picking up more and eventually got a hold of a wonderful uh, blood python from a, a local here in the Chicagoland area who's been breeding them for a very, very long time successfully. Um, and at that time, I mean, was there a fine distinction of, between the species, at least in the hobby? Did people really know the difference? Yeah, everything was a blood python. It didn't matter whether it was, you know, Python Curtis, there's, you know, the, the Sumatran short tails or the, and the Borneos or the bloods. Um, you know, at that time, everything was still, uh, you know, under Python Curtis and they were the separate three subspecies. Um, and I would, you know, having, having sort of really starting to splurge and jump into taxonomy at that stage, um, you know, I could tell from reading the papers and stuff that there was clear differences between them. And for somebody like me, it was, it was a little bit of a conflict there because I'm like, well, it doesn't meet that. Uh, subspecies status like I see with other things and thankfully later on you know we obviously had um, publications that eventually elevated them up to their own species status. So that that guy that was breeding them at the time I mean what did you learn from him kind of how were you keeping them at that time? Well most importantly it was actually a her um, probably one of the most impressive people I've ever met who can literally take just about any species and she, uh, hers are always the biggest and the most gorgeous and well taken care of. It's, it, it, you know, literally she's got kind of like the Dr. Doolittle when it comes to snakes. Um, it was actually one of the first people I actually, um, learned how to have respect for the potential of cross contamination between species. You know, this is before we really talked a lot about that. Um, but looking at that individual and they were fairly introverted and they were not very, um, open with what they, um, what they did successfully. Um, I felt like I had to work really hard because with them, because I wanted to really be part of that experience and wanted to understand from them as much as I could. And, they were down the basics. I mean, they really kind of boiled it down and it changed my perspective on how I listen to the snake in the sense of how they um, interact with you, how they respond to the environment around them, whether it's in a cage or whether you've got them out, you know, messing around on a floor or something. Um, it was really kind of paying more attention to things. And um, it's no surprise, I think, for a lot of us who are avid keepers of this is that we love the animals because the experience we get by interacting with them, um, as well as, you know, from the, the general appearance of the animals. And, you know, I love, I love to feel that, um, incredible musculature on the, um, on short tails, especially because they're such a stout, they're like little Schwarzeneggers. They're, they're so well built. Um, and yeah, they can be flabby, you know, um, and that's the problem that we often tend to overlook is that, um, we got to be careful that we don't uh, put them into a mold or a model that we think is appropriate, like the frequency of feeding. Um, and I think to that end of it, some of the common pet trade um, snakes that are out there set sort of this tempo that everybody wants to fit everything else into. And it really doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not one size fits all. So what are the, as far as body structure goes, I mean, what are you looking for in a blood or a short tail python? Well, I think, I think the first thing I always look at is um, looking to make sure that they've got a defined backbone. Um, and I'm not talking like an anorexic snake where they're all, you know, you can see the ribs and you can see the vertebrae. But, you know, where they can easily um, spread out and they get that really um, wonderful um, mid-body shape to them. Um, rather than think of it 
sort of I, I cross sectionally. Don't think of it as a, as a, a round tube, um, but think of it more as kind of like a, a Hershey's Kiss, where you've got that taper at the top. Um, that that way you can kind of tell that the the fat is not so much so that it started to you know um, shape the ribs or the vertebrae. And uh, people tend to forget that or not even be aware of that, especially snakes, reptiles in general, but snakes especially keep their fat inside the rib cage, inside the butt cavity. Um, so as much as they're spreading out, they're compressing everything inside. And and that's, you know, I always tell people, I think what you're like after Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and you're stuffed to the gills. And that's how these animals can become if we overfeed them. Um, unfortunately, they don't burn it off like we do. So that uncomfortable state, uh, remains for quite a long time until obviously they either, you know, they either pass whatever excess they have inside their body or, you know, somehow they start to burn off those, you know, that fat. Yeah. And I know that these animals are pretty much known for their crazy slow metabolism. <laughs> so, I mean, are they, first of all, are they eating rats this whole time? And then what's general frequency like for babies up to adulthood? Yeah. And everybody's got kind of their own, um, sort of recipe or meal. I call it the meal plan, the short tail meal plan. Um, you know, for me, I tend to feed larger prey less, less often. Um, when I get into about a year and a half to two years old, I, I, I found myself almost go into a monthly feeding plan. Um, up until that point, it's every two to three weeks and I gauge it, um, based on the activity of the animal. Um, there's a bit of variability on, you know, on, which animals grow faster than others. Um, I think I, I see, even though there's not a huge difference, like on the um, Bronger's my the red blood pythons, um, there's not a huge difference ultimately in age when you look at full grown adults between males and females as much. Same thing with the Borneos. Um, the, but the speed of growth, the females tend to seem like they, they gain a little bit of momentum early on um, and that might be because they're a little bit more efficient and that might be just because of the reproductive um, uh, demands that they often go through. Uh, when I see sort of the animals aggressively feeding, um, you know, I kind of have to pay attention a little bit to them, whether they're actually just food incentivized and not really necessarily needing it, or if it's something that, um, you know, am I actually building up um, sort of this habit of every time I, you know, interact with them, they think food is there. So, you know, I, I have to pay attention when I interact with them to make sure that they don't get to that food responsiveness the same way. And that's, you know, a lot of people associate, you know, my snake's aggressive. Well, if the only time you open up the cage is to feed them. And the one time you choose not to feed them, but to handle them, they're going to snap, you know, they're going to, they're going to have a feeding response to you. Um, so, and I always try to make sure, you know, you interact with them um, outside of feeding cycles, but when you are interacting with, um, with the animals themselves is pay attention to the contours of their body. Are they really spongy and jello-y type? Um, or do they feel like that when they actually slither through your hands is, do you feel like muscle? Do, does it feel like they're actually grabbing you back? And I do that even as juveniles. So sometimes through the course of just that sort of that interaction, um, I will gauge whether I feed them more frequently or less frequently. And uh, there's occasions where I'll use it as an incentive for them to kind of tone down their um, feeding response. Um, you know, I always feed at night. I don't feed during the day. And I found that the behaviors are, as they get older, are really consistent where they're not expecting food during the day. I do not get lunges by my animals during the day, even the even the young ones after maybe eight or, or 12 weeks. And part of that's because I feed them when the lights go out and I'm able to interact with them, handle them. And if I feel that they're getting too porky, I actually handle them more. I give them exercise. It's kind of like walking your dog. And I mean, it seems like they're not an animal that generally moves around a lot, right? As far as in a captive environment. That's the one thing I love about short tails. They, um, I'm a bulldog keeper, <laughs> and to me, the short tails are like the bulldog of the python world. So um, they're really, they're really mellow, really laid back. And to be honest with you, I like that part of it. Um, but don't mistake, they have power behind them. They're, um, they're, they're not, 
just because they're a sedentary species doesn't mean that they're a weak um, species. They are. They definitely have a lot of strength to them. Uh, it's deceptive. Um, so that's one of the things I think. I think many of the keepers who've had adults, you know, everybody's got a story about when we uh, feed um, your short tail pythons because they've they've done some damage to some freshly thawed out frozen rats. I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> I've had some splatter messes before. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> You, you think somebody hit it with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have those, just the shape of that head. It just seems like it could be dangerous. It just seems like it had, they have so much jaw power. Well, actually, it's not so much the jaw power. It's the body behind it. Um, they, they punch out very, very quick, and um, it's, it's kind of like a Bruce Lee jab. Um, you know, when they got all that body behind it, there's a lot of force. Um, I think the one thing that I have noticed is that their bite itself is not very pronounced. I mean, there's far worse bites you can get, and they their their teeth are fairly short and um, and narrow compared to other python species. Um, I'll take a, I'll take a hit from a, a five and a half six foot um, short tail python over a green tree python any day, and I've taken a number of those. Um, so I can definitely say they're going to make you bleed more than a short tail python will. Um, you'll be black and blue after the short tail because it felt like somebody punched you. Uh, so, uh, but it's something that you don't want to be in that position. Um, I tell people pay attention to behaviors of the animal. And I think as a rule of thumb, pretty much all snakes, having a snake hook is a, is a readily available, easy appliance to use because it does nothing other than introduce your coming into their enclosure. And after a while they get used to that, that, that inanimate object sort of waking them up. Um, it's kind of, I mean, I you think about how many different, um, behaviors that people, you know, complain about having with early, you know, early keepers with snakes. And a lot of them are just simply our mistakes of not reading the animals properly. And it's part of the reason why I think short tails especially are not necessarily, um, a beginner snake. And I use that very lightly. I've known people who have gotten short tails as their first snake and have been phenomenally successful with it. But I think some people are more attuned to the needs of the animal over uh, other people that may not necessarily have that um, sort of that affinity with the animal. And if you listen to the animals and you pay attention to what they're doing, um, there's absolutely no reason why you can't start with a short tail. If you've got a good coach, a good breeder that can help you walk through some of those um, rookie errors that can uh, you know occasionally happen in the begin beginning with keeping snakes. Yeah, so can you actually walk us through some of those as far as uh, husbandry goes? And, you know, I guess we can start off with, say, temperature, because I've, I've heard multiple different things about uh, bloods and short tails, and I know people do different things. Yeah, so I think one thing is we've been we're definitely keeping short tails too hot. Um, I think for the longest time, the rule was sort of to heat them up, thinking because of the tropical um, environment that we think they're from. Um, that and um, too much humidity. Um, I think, you know, we we mistake humidity, dampness for humidity, and that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, if you got a cage that's perpetually saturated um, because of conditions within the cage and, and the, out, the sort of the surrounding room environment, you get that condensation buildup. You know, you're going to get potentially mold and fungus building up. Um, you'll get a ridiculous amount of um, water inside the cage, which in some cases combined with um, the rate of that they urinate, you know, you can start seeing signs of um, skin blistering. Um, you know, there's actually something else going on and the water humidity is kind of um, hiding that. Um, so keeping the animals, I found, I tend, tend to side on side of, um, of cooler. So I keep mine between 78 and 80 degrees. Um, I've got a reptile room where I keep all my short tails in, which is ridiculously zeroed in at 79 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, 24 seven all year long. And I really provide more ambient um, temperatures than I do um, heated cage. Um, I do still offer it to them, but my, my heat tapes actually contact temperature right at the site where the animal actually would be laying on is probably more about 84 degrees. So it's a very subtle um, warming 
uh, you can, and I've done everything from radiant heat panels to uh, from over, from above to under tank heat with the uh, heat pads. Um, I've done incandescent lighting as a basking spot. Never had any success with that. Um, so I tend to go with a little bit darker enclosure, which means no lighting in the cage, uh, ambient light from the room itself. Um, mine are actually in either racks or terrestrial cages with sliding front doors. Um, you know, interacting with any snake from above is pretty threatening um, until the animal gets used to it. And a lot of keepers take them, you know, make the mistake of starting out with the inexpensive glass aquariums and or plastic tubs where you're coming from above. And you really got to, you have to really build a trust level with the animals so that they understand, you know, don't come at them directly from above. If you can sort of get them from the back end and sort of scoop them up from underneath, uh, you'll be far more successful with the way your interaction is with them in the long run. Um, you got to, you got to build trust and, Trust is only, you know, um, successfully achieved when you interact with the snake in positive ways. I mean, it goes with any species, right? Positive enforcement. But you got to pay attention to what's positive for them. Um, I, I think, you know, when you think about a hand coming at, you know, through the glass um, for anything, especially an animal that is uh, heat sensitized, um, you know, that's an intimidating um, and very um, aggressive posture. Uh, so never go to the face. Always come in from the lower third, uh, uh, lower half of the body. If you come up from a nut, from below, it's even better. Um, using distractions even. Um, I do that with um, some of the uh, more defensive hatchlings um, that come up that you, know, you could use different, way, different inanimate objects that sort of take the heat signature away in front of their face and still grab them from, you know, from underneath or from behind. Um, I mean, they have the ability, they can bite you if you're holding it, but I'll be honest with you, I find that with more species and less so with the short tails. Um, it's not that they say they won't, um, if they're really, really stressed out, they, their mouth is open and they're flailing in all directions, they probably bite themselves half the time. Um, I've, <laughs> I've had a couple like that. Uh, but one of the things I found recently, and I've actually, uh, interacted with, a couple of the other keepers as we've swapped notes um, is actually lowering incubation temperatures. Hmm. Um, there's even been some discussion. I know some of the Ro uh, Morelia folks do this as well with uh, using um, maternal incubation. But it definitely, I think with uh, short tail pythons, um, I have not done the maternal incubation, but I have definitely have done artificial incubation where I've set the uh, temperature down towards 86 degrees, 87 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I'm kind of a, I'm always checking on the eggs and I have them in containers and I'll open them up and I'll look at the eggs and examine them. So they're getting exposed to cooler temperatures, even if it's for that brief period of time, um, sometimes weekly. And I think sort of that variation does something. And I don't know if it's a chemical reaction but I've noticed that since I started doing that over the last, say, three or four years, um, consistently, the babies are consistently mellow. Even from clutches that I've hatched out over the years from the same pairings, and I've had literally all of them just, you know, I've had eggs or, or clutches that I've hatched out, and it'd have like, you know, two dozen short-tailed pythons, and it's like a bunch of little Velcro snakes. I mean, you stick your hand in to get them out of the, out of the egg chamber and they're all attaching to you. Um, <laughs> that was really disappointing. Uh, the, you know, the first time I went through that, literally every baby in that clutch just like, you know, bit me on its way out. Um, and it's amazing that I think once as we turn down the temperature and I see a couple people kind of talking about it too, it does prolong that the, um, the duration of hatching to some degree. And I think more often than not, um, there's a lot of variability on it, but you know, let let the animals develop at their pace. Um, you know, incubate them at a reasonable temperature. If they got to go a little bit longer, that's fine. Um, I do not manually pit the eggs. Um, I will only do that where um, I have concerns that um, there's not enough open slitting going on um, after the first snake um, pips. Just to kind of, and it literally, I'm, I'm giving it like a half inch little incision just to kind of give them that little edge. 
Um, but even then, it's rare. I tend to let them go the full ride. Um, I feel like if I manually pip them, um, often I have seen animals that have left their egg yolk, um, like, not fully absorbed into their belly, so they drag it out of the egg. Mm. It tends to pick up a lot of the uh, uh, substrate in the uh, egg chamber. And not that I've, I've never lost any animals that way, but it just looks at it, there's the odds of something happening could go wrong, and I'd rather them not be exposed to that. So let them sit in the egg and, and uh, suck all that egg yolk up. Um, because once they do, I've got babies that will go four to six weeks without having their first meal, and you can't even tell that they haven't eaten. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, and I've I've heard that they actually don't shed for quite a while, right, when they're out of the egg? Oh, yeah. I, it, it's, I'm glad I read that the first time um, because it is it is annoying. You know, you're, you, you know, when you're raising colubrids especially, you kind of get used to that. Oh, 10 days, 14 days, they shed, they're ready to eat, and, you know, you're, you move on your happy way. Um, Short-tailed pythons, I mean, they go months before having their first shed. They never have a, a post, uh, post-hatch post shed. And, you know, the, the first shed, I, because of my, I think the uh, rate in which I um, feed them, my first shed's usually at about four months. Um, I personally try to hold animals until I get that first shed, um, mainly just to make sure that everything is all, you know, moving forward and that good, that first shed actually is a good shed. Um, especially if I know that I'm going to be having people that are new into keeping short tail pythons or even new with snakes. Um, you know, there's always that concern. If you, the animal doesn't have a good shed at that age, there could always be some you know, complications. Is there any special considerations that you need to take before that first shed as far as keeping goes? No, just feed them. <laughs> I want to be able to make sure that they're eating along the way. And, you know, a lot of times I don't even offer their first meal for three weeks. Um, and I always offer frozen thawed, um, usually medium mice on the first meal after they hatch. Um, it depends, you know, some, I, I gauge it based on the size of the hatchling versus um, the size of the prey. So it, generally when you look at short-tailed pythons, um, I've not kept Curtis before, but I've kept Brighton Steeny and Brungers my pretty consistently over the years. And um, the Borneos tend to hatch out a little bit smaller. Um, see typically between 45 and, and 55 grams, whereas um, the blood pythons tend to, you know, they can hatch out at that size, but I also have had them hatch out much, much larger. And I tend not to give them a prey item that's excessively large as the first. I want them to get interested in eating. But they do shy away from small. I mean, would never offer a pinky to a hatchling short-tailed python. They just, they kind of look at you like, really? Give me something. <laughs> so um, usually medium mice. And by their fourth meal, they're actually on, um, some of mine will be on retired jumbo mice. I mean, it's right. you look at this and you're like, what's this little football doing inside my, you know, neonate <laughs> hatchling cage? But uh, they, they're, they're impressive on how much they can eat. Um, but you also have to make sure that you don't fill, pump them up with food to the point that they can't really properly digest it. And if there's going to be complications, uh, not that there typically is, but if there's going to be complications with with them, per, you know, digesting their food and passing it, um, I think that's probably what leads to a lot of people complaining about their snakes not defecating, you know, for six months or whatever, is because they, they they feed them too much. Um, the fur and the bones, you know, for what does get digested, takes a long time to absorb and digest. And even then, the fur doesn't completely digest. So if you're pounding all that fur into the animal um, over, a, over a period of time, it's going to accumulate. And it's just going to kind of bottleneck things. Um, Hydration is another issue. You know, I mean, they, they have to stay well hydrated. Um, out of all my snake, snake species I've kept, I'd say the short tails are the most prima donnas I've experienced you know, because they want their cage clean and they want their water clean all the time. And if you don't, they're going to punish you one way or the other. Um, so, so they typically only drink fresh water? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, it's funny to see them because they'll sit in their water bowl if you give it to them and they'll sour it up and they'll dehydrate. 
because the water is not really clean. So, you know, you got to evict them out of the water dish if you've got a water dish big enough to house them. Um, I typically don't give them a, a water dish big enough to actually sit in um, until they're at least, I think by that point, they're usually in the larger 32 quart tubs. And then I'm giving them the large, extra large dog bowls. And by that point, they can kind of fit into the bowl. Um, that's the first time they really get a chance to really um, sit in a bowl big enough for them to actually soak. Because if you do give it to them, the, you know, they're like a teenager in a hot tub. They're never going to get out. So, <laughs> so as the kind of like ball pythons, do you have any issues as far as if you set up a baby in something too big? Or uh, is there any considerations there? Yeah, it's interesting. So I keep I keep my short tail pythons and my ball pythons pretty much the same. Um, I think the only difference between the two is the frequency of feeding and the size of the prey. Where I feed larger prey to the short tails, I feed smaller, cert, much much substantially smaller prey to the ball pythons, but I'm feeding them more frequently. Um, interesting to note that when you do that, I mean the ball pythons, I think. Um, they will gain fairly substantial size fairly quickly because I think of that um, efficiency in them digesting their food. Um, whereas the short tails are kind of a slow and steady. I mean, you give, you give them a prey item and they could sit on that for a month. Um, whereas the ball python is really going to pass that pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, even with the ball pythons, I tend to give them larger prey and feed them more heavily the first year I have them. And I've been probably, you know, hatching and breeding ball pythons now for probably about 22 years, I think it is. Um, I don't know, something made me decide to hatch out ball pythons back when they were all wild-caught normals. And people thought I was nuts because they're like, I can get a ball python for $15 imported. And I'm like, yeah, but my captive bred ones eat, <laughs> you know, and they were handleable and they didn't have mites and you know, all this other stuff. So um, I actually, my, my, uh, my wonderful little self uh, self bluster is that uh, I hatched ball pythons before they were cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a it was actually uh, uh, I'll, I'll give credit out to Brian Potter. Uh, he was actually the one who said, "Well, you know, you're breeding all these ball pythons. Why don't you actually get some money out of it?" So um, I got into the morph scene. You know, back in the day, it was too cheap to really spend anything significant. But um, I think I I think I ended up buying. Um, I think it was pastel and a, and some head albinos back around uh, ninety nine two thousand. So um, I want to I want to get more into ball pythons, but I want to uh, because the the blood and short tail people in the chat. We got uh, designer exotics April. We have uh, Graham Battison. We have Dan Magano was in here earlier. So yep, uh, they're gonna freak out if I don't if I don't really cover this. So uh, even though they've heard all this stuff before, right? They know what they're doing. They but, know it. They know it. <laughs> but um, as far as the, the babies are, is it typical that they all eat right off the bat, or and then also what are some tricks to get them feeding? I mean, if a, if there is a piggy feeder, we're talking about ball pythons, right? Um, blood you short short tail. Tail. All right. Um, so I actually have somewhere, um, I actually had like a two page recipe on how to get something to eat. Um, and it started with the ball pythons back when I used to take in, uh, ball pythons, um, through the rescue. And, and certainly when I was, you know, breeding, raising and breeding my own and having to provide other people counts on how to get theirs to eat. Um, I think that the trick on it is the prey. Um, if you're going to go the frozen thawed route, which I'm always, I, I strongly encourage people to do for many reasons. Um, it's more cost effective in the long run. Um, it's, it's certainly more flexible, you know, not that I think there's any severe threat of shortages, but you know, there are times of the year when you, you do run out of prey and it's good to have that on, you know, having a, a stash in your freezer for that. Um, but Taking taking the the rodent naturally, allowing it to thaw out. So for me, my best practice has always been: I take the rodents out of a deep freezer in the morning, and I get up unfortunately fairly early. So you know, five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, everything's laying out in my reptile room, um, and I let it naturally thaw out all the way up out throughout the day. And um, I actually will drop them in some hot water and get the temperature of the um, uh, the frozen uh, thawed out uh, rodents. Up to anywhere from uh, um, 105 to 115, and even 115 seems awfully high. But I found that 
um, it actually uh, initiates sort of their um, uh, heat sensory food driven response. And um, when I do this, literally all the animals in my um, snake room are, are, are wired. Like they know dinner's coming. Um, so the smell is kind of like mom's home cooking and, and, and it really gets them going, which for somebody who keeps a lot of snakes, it's easy. If you're the single, you know, sort of the single uh, keeper, the biggest challenge there is how do you get the same sort of um, excitement out of the animals by the smell and everything else? And and part of that might be, you know, as you're warming the animal up or thawing it out, thawing it out within proximity of the enclosure um, throughout the day. And then, you know, you give it that nice douse of, of um, hot water and using tongs, you know, to distance yourself from the animal. Um, and you know and offer the food up but offer the food at not you know when the lights are out don't don't offer it when they're under a basking spotlight at three o'clock in the afternoon um you know it'd be like trying to wake us up at you know two o'clock in the morning and give us breakfast we're just not necessarily <laughs> geared towards that um it's a different story if you're out drinking the night before and you're hitting white castle all the way that's, that's <laughs> different <issue. laughs> but the uh the challenge there is is making sure you understand the behavior of the animal you know and you know, obviously you don't want to feed any animal uh, who's going to be going through even the uh, shed cycle. So you got to pay close attention to the spectacles and looking at the rest of the body to make sure that they're not in some type of pre-shed cycle. Um, some of them will eat. I mean, my short tail pythons, I literally, they don't have an off switch. They're eating all the time. I swear, even then, even if they're locked up with a, you know, with a female, I've had males smell the food going nuts. Um, but with ball pythons, I've noticed that you definitely kind of have to sort of build up the, the meal time um, for them. And with the short tails, you know, they're really focused on the heat. If I get lazy and I don't thaw the rodent out um, to a, a, an adequately warm temperature, like I said, um, more often than that, they're just going to kind of, they, they may grab it out of reaction, um, but then they're just going to be like, eh, it's not warm enough for me. You know, they, they can tell. Um, and I've got a couple animals that, you know, the garbage pails, I mean, literally you can, it's half frozen. You can stick it inside the cage and they'll still eat it. Um, but that's not healthy either. You want, you want to, you know, sort of jumpstart the digestion. Um, I know with folks that keep, uh, some of the more difficult feeding, uh, snakes, you know, we'll do things like slitting and do stuff like that. You definitely don't need to do that with the short tails. They digest things pretty good on their own. Um, quite honestly, uh, thawing out r rats in really high temperatures, you're already dealing with the risk of them being um, subject to ridiculous splatter pattern type of <laughs> reactions. Well, um, it, it does soften the skin up, unfortunately, sometimes. We have... Um... I've shared uh, some rooms as well as some tables with some blood and short tail people. And every single time they have pretty much cleared out the room or the area within 15 feet of it. And it, it looks like a Doberman <laughs> took a shit in the, in the tub. So yeah, I like the I like the St. Bernard analogy. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, pretty impressive when they finally do take a dump you're like really that came out of you and uh, <laughs> uh you know i think i don't i don't know what it is about reptile people we're the I, we're probably the only animal enthusiasts that take pictures not of just the animals but of their feces <laughs> it's like you gotta see this turd it's huge you know and uh i you know i almost feel like there's got to be a there's there's a tribute here uh, that is in the making on uh, an award for, uh, you know, massive poop award for somebody at some event. So, <laughs> so you guys need to start weighing them and competing. <laughs> uh, well, I know I know a few folks that definitely do uh, weights of, uh, of input and output. So um, which actually is, a, is one thing that um, I, I don't think there's enough research done on short tail specifically but um you know it's amazing how i would say a high percentage of the food intake you know if you just sort of measure the gross volume of food going into the animals versus um the retention of that in um you know body mass building during the growth state but i mean it's a i i i'm impressed by how much they retain back and i mean it's on the order of you know, 40, 35 to 40% or more. Um, 
So, you know, it's something to consider that if they're actually taking that food and they're converting that to body tissue in some way, whether it's developing bones or muscles or organs, um, you have to think it takes time to do. And if you keep just, you know, sausage making and keep for forcing these animals with the food, um, you're going to find yourself with um, an interesting situation where the body can't keep up with that sort of the manufacturing of the of the um, the body mass. And uh, it's either going to clog the system, which is, you know, why we get these uh, um, epic uh, fe fecal matters, um, or it's going to cause other problems, which is the, you know, the potential for impaction or, or at least enough that for once the animal's actually going to refuse food, you know? Um, and then you have to wonder why, you know? Um, and if they're not optimally kept in a condition where they can start breaking down that food, if there's too much in there, um, you have to question what the gut is looking like at that point is you got you know, potentially um, not thoroughly digested food and they're decomposing inside the animal um and yeah you can see that i mean if anybody's kept pythons you know there's flatulence you know but you have to wonder how much of that is because there's too much gas buildup and is there anything to do to kind of move the process along if you do have a snake that you know maybe you think is impacted oh uh, we'll stop feeding it for one um keep it pretty hydrated i you know i've always found success with multiple species of providing um, periodic soaking. Um, and I think pretty much all, all reptiles in general, whether it's, you know, lizards or um, even tortoises and, and uh, snakes is if you, if you soak them in, in a fairly tepid water and, you know, give them time and they're moving around stuff, um, they feel, they feel comfortable enough and maybe the absorption of the water in some ways helps them out. And they, you know, they move that stuff um, through their system. Um, that's usually my um, advice to anybody who has an animal that they think is is backed up. As I said, you know, just start soaking it. You know, soaking it, um, gently massaging it. There's no harm in, in in actually interacting with the animal. I mean, if it's stressful, don't um, don't massage them. But you know, sometimes, yeah, you know, I found. Um, when there's a large buildup of urates on the back end of the animal, um, just gently massaging near the vent and stuff like that. It feels like a bag of marbles. It's, it's, it's incredible how much they can build up. Um, they, um, you know, they kind of tolerate it to some degree. And when they don't, you, you leave them alone, you know, um, but that also, that also helps you continue to build that trust, you know, and, and I don't care if it's an animal you've had for 10 years, it's always been placid. Um, they could go Jekyll and Hyde on you if they're under a great deal of physical stress. Um, and health, health issues will turn a, a normally placid animal into, you know, a little stinker because just like us, if we don't feel good, we're not going to be, we're not going to be nice and friendly. Yeah. And I've seen uh, bloods and short tails go into flail mode and I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing worse than the, the, uh, helicopter shit spin. <laughs> 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 which is usually more urates than anything else, but it, you know, it starts coming out and it's, yeah, it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah. So um, I know that you work with some locality stuff. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, it's really tough to kind of, um, you know, get really good locality information on short tail pythons because a lot of them are just sort of collected generally and, Many of them, if not all of them, have flown through the uh, leather trade. Um, so it's a little suspect as to, you know, where their origins are. So we generally see some that are uh, phenotypically associated with um, a region because of the patterning is typical out of coming out of that. So you, you got the Tobas, which has some really distinct pattern. Uh, you got the Banka Islands, which um, aside from being a, sort of a color and pattern unique, animal they also have a um, smaller size about them as well um at least the bankos that i have worked with um are substantially smaller than you see with other um blood pythons um and then of course you know i've i was i had the opportunity back in 99 uh through um 
uh, opportunity with Chris Carmichael, whose twin brother, Rob Carmichael, runs a wildlife discovery center here in Illinois. And Rob's got all sorts of fun species he's been working with. And those two brothers used to work at uh, Brookfield Zoo. And, um, and I guess during Chris's, I think he was working with the Tuatara. He was with Tracy Barker on that type of research. And I think that, you know, having that connection, well, when the Barkers ended up basically being gifted these uh, very unique Borneo pythons, uh, very melanistic, um, they put them in, uh, in Chris's hands. And uh, Chris was able to produce them for the first time um, back in 99 and uh, was able to get um, a pair um, and his brother Rob got a pair. And uh, it was kind of like, you know, we called him up, you know, Rob called me up and said, hey, you want some short tail pythons? It's like, sure, what the heck, you know? And he's getting them from his brother, Captain Brad, they're totally different than anything else. And I'm like, sure, you know, I'm up for the challenge. And uh, mine did very well. Uh, Rob didn't have the success on it, so he sent them back to his brother to kind of get him going. Um, and what I thought was 1.1 1 .1 ended up being 0 0.2, two girls. Um, and it took years before I figured it out. Um, and I, again, was not in a huge rush, so it was not a big deal for me. Um, but what actually, in hindsight, actually was a huge opportunity. Um, you know, when we figured out that both girls ovulated at the same time, <laughs> uh, rather than breeding, um, and I was actually table, you know, sharing the pictures with Chris, he's like, yeah, it looks like two girls. <laughs> um, we ended up working on uh, getting, he ended up uh, getting a male um, that he had uh, access to through another gentleman by the name of Bob Garby in uh, Michigan. So um, as it so happens, not only did Bob end up giving me a male, Bob actually took the remaining import female from Chris. And later, a couple years later, I ended up taking in, um, Chris's entire, or uh, not Chris's, uh, Chris at that point had, lost many of the animals due to an accident in his uh, research facility where the only one import was still alive, which was unrelated to the two uh, females I had. And Bob actually ended up having a male that was only related by, I think uh, the sire was common between my two girls. So Bob ended up um, giving me a, a male, um, which I raised up, took about three years, I think it was, um, and bred them to both of the girls that I had, and they both took. Um, I ended up having, uh, and I'm talking about the Sarawak um, Borneos. Um, I ended up getting, I think it was like 26 out of one clutch and 24 on the other, and all, and 100% hatch. Um, what's what's typical clutch size, by the way, for, for that locality in particular? Well, for the, for the Sarawak, they tend to be... Um, they're unusual for a Borneo because they're sexually dimorphic more so than any of the other species that I've noticed of, of short tails. Um, the female, the, the one female I had at the time was well over six and a half feet long. Um, the female I currently have right now, who's um, an F1, F2, F2. Um, she's like, I want to say she's just at six foot. Um, very, very stout body because I thought she was a male. So I was, you know, I didn't really push her and she grew at that rate. And it's when I started realizing by the time she was reaching this size, she was very massive. But the male I have, which is the original male that I got from Bob Garby uh, back in, I think it was around 2000, 2000 or 2001, um, Bob's male is not even five feet long. So, um, and all my males are a lot smaller and, so, but it's really hard to say, is that, is that unique to them? You know, there was only, I think, six animals collected out of the wild. Um, and I think only a few of them actually were part of the reproduction. So, you know, looking at this, it's, um, it's interesting to see, you know, every, to me, everything about them is different. Um, their pattern is completely different from typical Borneos. Um, their scales are, are more dimpled. Um, it's kind of like comparing, you know, it's like comparing uh, Christmas wrap to bubble wrap in some ways. Um, the Sarawaks that I've had have all had that real interesting texture to them. Um, the fact that they're sexually dimorphic was another big, you know, big clue there that they were different. And and they tend to, um, 
darken as they get older, whereas pretty much all the Borneos I've worked with um, have all been relatively consistent from their hatchling color and pattern all the way through adulthood. They don't go through any uh, change of, of coloration. Um, they might lighten up a little bit on the creams, but the Sarawak is the Sarawak, the pink bakers, the Tobas. Um, I want to say there was, I don't know too much about the Curtis ones. I haven't had the luxury of working with them, but I know the yellowhead Curtis are, are distinctly separate from um, the other um, black Sumatra short tails. Are those so, the ones that they call chrome heads? Is that just a different way to? No, the yellow head's completely different. Actually, okay. when I first heard, I saw the first yellow head, I thought it was a Borneo. Um, they're very, they have that just almost like a, a pumpkin colored head and, and sort of this dark brown, black bodied um, appearance. The traditional, or I don't know what you want to call the the regular um, Python Curtis that we typically see in the pet trade. Um, the chrome versus black head is, um, I think, is more lineage than anything else. Um, you know, I mean, there is certainly with blood pythons, with Pyth Python Barnard's mind, they have the ability of um, expressing mood coloration in their head in varying degrees. Um, so um, that I think is a, um, I think is a big sort of a big factor, I guess, in some of some of the lines that we've seen is that. Um, you know, I know a couple of people focused on when they saw the chrome heads or silver heads coming out, they were actually focusing on breeding for that appearance. Um, I don't know if that, I don't think, I don't know if that has any locality specific origins or not. Um, maybe when we see the next uh, uh, Blood Python book coming out from uh, hopefully from David Tracy Barker um, at some point, we may have, may, may have some more insight on it. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. I've been looking forward for a long time, but. Um, you know, when I wrote my book, it was more or less the, sort of a, it was a, uh, what do you call it, an amuse-bouche uh, dinner aperitif uh, to get sort of get people's uh, taste. But it was more or less to actually start um, giving people some information on what's out there and sort of dispel some of the myths. Um, yeah, I see, you know, uh, Dan Magano and, and a couple of other folks that are on the, on the chat. And, you know, we didn't have, when we first started all this, we didn't have you know, videos, we didn't have, you know, YouTube and, and podcasts and stuff. So, you know, we keep hearing about these sort of urban myths regarding the species and we need to get more publications, more authoritative details out there for people to refer to. So they're not asking their, you know, their colubrid buddy who say, Hey, how do you keep blood pythons? Well, I've heard. <laughs> right. Have you ever kept one? No. <laughs> but I think it's interesting just listening to your stories that, um, I mean, whether there's information out there or not, you have gotten these personal relationships with all these people with the right information, with the right animals. And I mean, that's really helped you out in your journey. It has. And I mean, um, I still have the original VPI um, Borneos that I got from uh, Dave and Tracy back in um, 90. I got them in 99. There were 98 hatchlings. And, um, you know, they're, they're phenomenal animals. And you could you can see... You know, that was, you know, how many years ago, 20, you know, 22 years ago that they they were produced and, and, you know, they're still, they're still being produced and there's so many um, wonderful things that we've learned about their genetics and how well they, you know, they do with selective breeding in different forms. And we, unfortunately, I think with the Borneos, we still haven't completely unraveled the, the Borneo unique gene activity going on there. But. It seems like nothing's been figured out. It seems like it just gets more confusing, to be honest, at least for oh, yeah. a yeah. person that's outside of it. Well, and yeah, I'm sure you talked to Matt Minatello, who's got some fantastic Borneos out there, and he's probably still scratching his head today every time something <laughs> comes up. So um, it's like the more you breed, the, the less you really figure it out. It's kind of like, oh, you really did that? Um, and, and I've I've tried chasing the granite gene now for, you know, pretty much 20 years. And every time I produce, you know, I outcross, I breed back line and I'm like, and I turn around and I go, all right, I never get the results I expect. And, you know, <laughs> and it's to confuse matters even more. Now we've got other sort of lineage names. We got, you know, our appearances, we got the marbles and, you know, I remember back in the day, I think it was probably early King Snake when we were we had these, you know, interesting dialogues back and forth about 
is it a marble? Is it a granite? Is it a marble? Is it a granite? And, you know, at that time I was, I was pretty clear on, Oh, I know what a granite is. I know what a marble is. And then now flash forward. Now I'm like, I have no clue. I, I think, I think people have <laughs> bred the line so much. It really doesn't matter. Um, other than the fact that you cannot predict what the babies are going to look like, um, which is actually pretty cool. Um, you know, it's, it's bad for me because as a breeder, um, I will produce a clutch of eggs and I look and I'm like, I can't get rid of any of them. <laughs> and here I am, you know, I've, I've got far more than I should. And, you know, I'm kind of figuring out like how many more cages I'm going to buy and, um, you know, go big or go home, I guess. So did you start or did you get interested at least? I mean, obviously you've had some of these animals since the, the late nineties, but when the say red blood morph started coming out, I mean, did you have any interest in those? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, just out of the simple curiosity of trying to see what the genetics will do. Um, I'm not, um, I'm limited on the number of animals that I will produce in a year, um, just for logistics reasons, as well as for, you know, just, uh, pragmatic reasons. And I have a, I have a, I'm a financial compliance professional and I, I have very long, uh, work weeks. So I don't really have a lot of time to have a large collection, you know, hopefully in a couple of years that might change, but, um, the focus is really always to be able to make sure that what I do keep, I keep good quality. Um, and that I've had the added, um, I call it pleasure, um, more so than responsibility of, of being heavily involved in, in doing the uh, rescue activities, you know, f um, for the last 23 years. Um, and it was, you know, it's easier these days, um, doing rescue than it was back then. But, um, I think with, the morphs that are coming in, I'm starting to dabble in, you know, um, three, four gene animals, um, just to try and see what happens. So I'm playing the long game and I know a lot of people have been kind of, um, playing the short game with, you know, trying to get the, uh, co-dominant traits to pass on. But, uh, you know, I remember when the ball pythons were, you know, six digit, you know, values and, and at the end of the day, you're really breeding because you want to be able to breed and hatch out something really cool if you're not in it for the money. So, um, yeah, I would, I would love to see a golden eye sun glow or something goofy like that, where you've got so many genes in there, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to hatch one out. I'm going to keep it. Everybody's going to ask how much, and I'm going to like how much I wouldn't even know what price to put on it, you know? And since, you know, if I hatch one out, it's staying. <laughs> I mean, them all. <laughs> as a as a guy who is well versed at least in financials and stuff like that, I mean, has that kept you from blowing all your money on blood pythons? Uh, yeah, um, I blow <laughs> I blow enough money to make it dangerous. Um, you know, I this is my uh, single um, passion and love, and I think um, as I explore sort of like what I'm doing in the next stage of my life, um, I'm realizing that, you know, I've been very fortunate that the uh, profession I chose and the sort of the decisions, the employment decisions I've been able to uh, benefit and make over the time have left me in a good position where I can, you know, I could actually spend a little bit of money to do things in a smart way. Um, and, you know, from that end of it, yeah, I want to have, I want to have a fun collection of, you know, um, of animals, but the, you know, the value of that d diminishes over time because, you know, when somebody hatched out the first little cystic, you know, ball python, um, or actually imported it. Um, the issue was, is that at some point it's going to be mainstream, um, if we do our jobs well, and, we need to focus more on if I'm going to do that, I want to be able to make sure that the animals I breed them to are high quality, good, healthy animals. And, um, you know, I could have an animal producing for 10 years. So why burn it out in the first couple of years? And, um, you know, it's not a business for me. So I have the luxury of, of being able to enjoy the animals along the way. And I just did an educational event where I basically, you know, I, literally pulled in with a cart into the show and i'm like oh my gosh i've got like i'm going to be letting people look and handle you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of animals just because i want them to see something different and and at the same time too i was like eh, you know i mean 
they're prized regardless of the dollar amount somebody else associated with it. So, um, you know, I got to, you got to learn to appreciate them all for that perspective. Um, it's, it's a comfortable position I think to be in because I don't have to worry about making a paycheck off of it. Um, the upside to it also is that then it also puts me in a position to be, I hope to be in a more prominent position to talk more um, sort of, um, scholarly about where our hobby should go um, because I think we do need to have some degree of responsibility and respect for what we do here, not for ourselves, but for the generations that are going to follow. And, you know, we should, we should be ethical about how we do it. Um, you know, we know there's some unethical elements within, you know, the hobby as there is with other professions. Um, so as much as we can, you know, elevate those who are doing things properly and, you know, trying to continue the fight so that we can actually have these animals for many, many years to come. Um, you know, I've been, you know, been a benefit, um, benefited from the efforts of uh, USR Compijack. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to actually speak at the uh, uh, Pijack the, or PJAC, depending on who you talk to, uh, conference, uh, t you know, two years ago. And, um, you know, recognizing that even if we do our um, part well, we have situations that are completely out of our control. Um, you know, here we are sequestered basically with social distancing because of the coronavirus and the impact it has on us. Um, I think about if this similar situation with Nido virus, uh, you know, with the reptiles, you know, not being able to easily uh, you know, sell or even procure animals because of fear that we might be introducing an animal into our collection that has, you know, a potentially, um, you know, impactful virus um, or pathogen. And now though, that's something that we just found out about, you know, we probably, it's probably been around for a long time. It's not novel, but it's novel to species that haven't been exposed to it. Kind of like what we're dealing with COVID, you know, 19. Um, we don't know what it's, you know, what the long run of implications are. Um, and I had, I actually, through my job at the time, I was involved with the original avian flu and, um, H1N1, um, outbreaks, um, and having to deal with employees that were abroad during those periods of time. And what we did at that stage, now we're talking 2003 and then 2009, respectively, of planning a pandemic response, you know, um, and here we are again <laughs> it is when you know depending who you talk to or what you believe um and this one you know it it could be worse or it could not be worse um but the reality but is the, it, the measures have been more drastic than i've ever seen in my lifetime at least uh yeah and i think part of that is a little bit of fixing the barn door after the horse is gone so i think had we had a little bit better um appreciation of what the risk was as a as a as a world um, they probably could have done a better job of containment earlier on, which would have been less of an issue downstream for everybody else. Um, but there's, you know, we don't know enough a lot about what's going on. And I know, uh, I know there's some research going on related to that. I mean, the good news is, you know, we know SARS is, we did a lot of work on that back in 2003. So at least we're not starting from scratch. So. And I mean, as I guess, at least looking at it as from a keeper's perspective, um, well, as humans right now, we're quarantined. Uh, Which is a good animals. thing for reptile people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's perfect. It's our natural habitat, I think. You got but but we, we keep our animals in pretty tight quarters as far as, uh, you know, in tubs, they're above, below, next to each other. I mean, how do we kind of add a layer of biosecurity, I mean, going forward? Yeah, so that's one of the things that... Um, jokingly, um, things that keep you up at night and NIDO virus probably keeps me up more than, um, other, other pathogens, um, only because we still are trying to figure out, you know, um, what the, uh, what the conditions are of how the animals get it, how it spreads. Um, uh, I had, um, I think my personal collection would have been farther gone along had I not uh, encountered a situation back, uh, many years ago that, uh, essentially forced me to reboot my entire collection. Um, I had, I had to move in, well, I had to move, I, I wanted to move into, uh, this house where I'm at now. And 
I had to split my collection up into two parts. And somewhere along the line, after I got the animals back, there was an exposure and um, one half of my collection, which thankfully was um, isolated, um, even after I got the animals back, um, resulted in a significant loss. Um, that's part of the reason why I don't really um, breed ball pythons, high-end ball pythons, is because I lost tens of thousands of dollars of animals due to an outbreak because of an exposure. And it's at that time that I, I really literally shuttered everything, went into deep, um, sort of a deep quarantine. And it wasn't until literally um, five years later that I, you know, I decided that, okay, you know, everything's, everything's kind of passed through, testing has come back, everything's good. Um, it wasn't Nido. We didn't even know about Nido at that time, but um, it was it was something I learned. And now I follow. Oh my gosh, ridiculous strict quarantines. Um, I still do wildlife rescue, but I've done it in such a way it's almost like a hazardous material situation. Um, I actually have separate clothing when I deal with those animals. They're actually housed completely in a separate part of the house. Um, and even then, I'm we're only talking a couple animals every so often. I do more logistical coordination than I do actual taking in animals um, versus what I did 20 some odd years ago. You know, I, I was taking in animals left and right. And, you know, we were sort of naive and happy with, with uh, not realizing that there was other risks associated with, you know, having all this massive amount of animals coming through multiple species. Um, you know, I, I lived right next to Brookfield Zoo, so all the calls that went into Brookfield Zoo for several years were actually all redirected to me. So um, I had very good neighbors from that perspective. <laughs> Between law enforcement stopping at my house and the Chicago Zoological Society stopping at my house and other animal control officers stopping off, and, and everybody was like, why are they dropping things off at you? <laughs> what, is the, what is the most interesting thing that you've had dropped off at your house? Oh, uh, well, we stopped having things dropped off at my house since I moved. That was perfect. <laughs> it's like, we need to move. We need to get out of here. Everybody's dropping things off. Um, wow. Uh, the I would say the coolest thing that I actually had to turn away, not turn away, but um, put in more competent hands was a as was an exceptionally large adult Matamata turtle. Broke my heart to get rid of that. Um, but, yeah, I, I, that was... Not necessarily exotic in that sense, but to see, a, um, and it was in captivity for quite a long time, and it was extremely healthy, and it was massive, it was a big female, and uh, I love Matamata, so I was like, oh, I really want to keep it, and I'm like, there is no way I can keep it. Um, I had uh, some fairly unusual species that came through. We had, um, I had like the things that came through that, I don't know if they're necessarily, you know, truly exotic in it, but we had like Haitian and Cuban boas come in and you don't see those too often then, um, or at least not up here in, you know, Illinois. Um, I remember when I got a call on an animal control for a, uh, um, a monitor lizard, they could not figure out what the heck it was. All they knew was it had this beautiful blue turquoise tail and I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> And it was a blue tail monitor. Um, it was actually one of two blue tail monitors that were confiscated. One went to Brookfield Zoo, and uh, and I ended up uh, inheriting the second one. Um, so, and at that point, we really hadn't. They weren't really. I mean, I knew about they were coming out, uh, but we hadn't seen them yet um, in the trade as much. So, um, that was pretty cool. Um, that was in '99, I think it was. Wow. So. You got to remember too, right? And we're talking, you know, this is corn boy here. I'm, you know, I'm in the Midwest, and we've got international airport that brings in all sorts of goofy stuff. And uh, you know, we ended up one of my uh, one of my peers ended up getting a five and a half gaboon viper pulled out of a dumpster near O'Hare Airport. You know, oh, God. you know, <laughs> I can't claim to that one because I did not get it. But you know, um, I was the first one on the phone. Says you'll never believe what I just got from animal control. So. <laughs> But, uh, you know, forest cobras, I mean, we've had a couple of those. Um, we've had, you know, rattlesnakes, uh, you know, people out in the Southwest are probably laughing at me because they're like, God, we see rattlesnakes all the time. You know, it's like, yeah, not in Illinois. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got some gardener working on, you know, or, uh, I think we had some uh, masons working on putting some uh, flagstone on the front of a house. And they had a container uh, from Colorado Springs shipped in of this, you know, 
premium rock. And as they were going to unload the rock out of there, there was a prairie rattlesnake city right on top oh, wow. of the pallet. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I got that call. I was meeting my wife for lunch. And they're like, they're like, uh, yeah, we think we got a rattlesnake. And I'm like, it's a fox snake. We got fox snakes all the time. They all rattle, you know. And uh, he's like, no, I think this is a rattlesnake. And I said, well, what makes you think it's a rattlesnake? He says, you know, we had we had the infestation of the cicadas at the time. He's like, well, the cicadas are really loud, and this thing's rattling louder than the cicadas. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess maybe you might have a rattlesnake. <laughs> so, yeah, I showed up there, uh, and I within five minutes, we found it, a little, you know, um, prairie rattlesnake. Um, unfortunately, he was on a pallet, and there was like seven pallets shipped in, so we had to I spent what was intended to be a morning of uh, doing some, you know, therapeutic reptile fun. Uh, I ended up uh, removing seven pallets of flagstone uh, with some oh, construction man. workers and then teaching them how to safely remove it in case there was, because it was a small one. So we were worried about maybe another one. Um, and then I remember vividly as I'm meeting my wife for lunch, I'm like, I got to stop at the container store and get a container because I, like an idiot went out of the house with only snake bags and hooks and not anticipating that I was just going to pick up a venomous snake on the way to lunch. So and my wife was, a Oh yeah. You know, my wife was a trooper. She's like, Oh, she goes, so what type of rattlesnake? Oh, it's, it's in, you know, Colorado Springs. So it's probably an Indian prairie, you know, rattlesnake and she or a uh, prairie rattlesnake. And she goes, Oh, cool. She goes, you can't keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a rule in your house? Venom, no venomous. Yeah, we got, uh, unfortunately, I cannot keep anything uh, that my wife feels is um, unmanageable by her. And that includes venomous and crocodilians. You can't blame her. but No, no, but I, I did babysit a 18-foot uh, purple albino retic for about a couple of months. And she was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I got to give her credit. Uh, you know, she's a, she's probably less of a herper than I am, but she's uh, she's starting to She's got her own reptile room. So, uh, you know, she's into the smaller um, species, mainly poison darts, um, various uh, geckos and gnolls and stuff like that. So anytime I get uh, hijack um, species like Cuban frogs, tree frogs, you know, uh, Mediterranean geckos and stuff that come in on potted plants, uh, which we've had a, a lot of them this time of the year for some other reason. And she's she's right on it. She does uh, well, as you can appreciate. She's really good at uh, the isopods, so uh, ah. she uh, she does that for the poison darts. So she's uh, oh, I got fruit flies, I got isopods. You know what? You know I'll take care of them. I'm like okay, you know? <laughs> that's awesome. I need they need to have substance for me. They got to be big. <laughs> There's some big isopods. Uh, our buddy Greg in the chat. He was in Madagascar. He found this green isopod that was like the size of a softball. Oh, they'll see that. No, that'd be kind of cool. You know, that's where you start getting weird for me, at least. Like I kind of <laughs> like them small once they get that big. I don't know. Well, you're talking to a guy who's got a couple of adult sulcatas. So you know, big is better uh, in my book. So <laughs> there you go. So, I mean, a lot of those rescues, you must have had times or you must have at least gotten comfortable with uh, administering some some treatments. We did. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot. I had some very supportive, um, reptile vets. Um, we've got, uh, actually surprisingly, we got some really fantastic reptile, uh, vets in, in the Chicagoland area. And I had access to a couple of them who were, uh, very prominent in, um, ARAV and, you know, helping publish, um, literature on reptiles and amphibians. And of course, University of Illinois has got a, um, Greek veterinary school as well. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot, um, you know, trial and error in some cases, you know, I, I remember my early on, I remember going to a vet who was, uh, providing support to Brookfield zoo. And I, <laughs> I brought this lizard and he looked at it and he goes, Oh, really cool. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, Oh, it's called a pleurus quadrimaculatus. I said, just call it a Madagascan desert iguana. So, you know, it's, so we've had all sorts of, um, oddball things that were coming through. Um, you know, one of the um, most memorable experiences I think I had was I took in a large number of um, Indo-Australian snakes that were um, part of a confiscation where there was a king cobra involved. 
So a lot of the snakes were um, a combination of feeders as well as animals that were probably imported along with for sale. And they were all in really bad shape. So I ended up taking in, I think it was like 15 Lassus Fuscus, um, basically water pythons, um, and a number of them. Um, uh, now I think that's a Leo Python, uh, Leo Python. White lips? Galberts. Yeah, the white lips. So um, shameful. I can't remember the taxonom taxonomic changes these days. No, but, but yeah. that one's tricky. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then one of them ends in hoser eye, so we don't even talk about it. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't talk about that. Um, but the, um, the Albert's pythons I took in, I had, uh, five adults and two juveniles and, um, all of them came with, uh, real bad, um, infections inside their mouths. Um, so it was, you know, interacting with, I mean, the five adult, the Alberts, I mean, they were gnarly stressed out animals and they were not, um, small animals. So, um, I had to give them injections. Um, they were getting, you know, shots. Um, I think at that time we had avoided things like Batril and moved to like things like Amikis and, um, and I don't even think Ceftazidine and the, the generic was available. I think we're on Fortaz and we're given, I'm giving these guys injections. So it was soaking them first, getting them well hydrated and given the injections. It's the only time in my life I've, I was forced to use snake, you know, restraining tubes on a regular basis. Um, and then of course, irrigating their uh their face with uh um you know everything from peroxide um to on the surface we're using sildenine and stuff so took a lot of treatment um got them all to survive they were all in great shape um they actually were pretty tractable with me when i was done but i just was not in a position to um keep them um even though we're, i mean they're phenomenal looking animals and um i ended up relocating them and um I remember one of the keepers that took him in had this story. He's like, yeah, he said, I want to go clean the cage. And he said, I don't know how you work with them things. I said, no, they were fine. Why? He said, well, I opened up the Neodesha cage, and this thing came lunging out and bit him in the chest and left a perfect print out <laughs> on his white T-shirt. He said, I had this blood mark on there like it was a big set of kissed lips. I'm like, mm-hmm. I said, well, rule number one, don't stand in front of the cage when you go and open up. <laughs> So, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, everybody's got stories for stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's kind of fun, but it was, I mean, for me, it was rewarding. Um, I think the first year, first three years I was chair for the adoptions program for the CHS, I was averaging, uh, 1300 animals a year. Wow. Um, I That's was wild. getting, yeah, I was, and, and this was the time when it was bearded dragons or I'm sorry, not bearded dragons, um, green iguanas and Burmese pythons. So it was not unusual for me to get six, seven iguana calls a day. And um, I was getting, I mean, there were times um, I was getting Burmese pythons, you know, they were hitting a nine, 10 foot mark and people would get rid of them. And there was one weekend I took in like five that were over 10 feet. So um, how'd you house all these animals? I had, um, I had cage space for them. I actually um, was very fortunate that I was able to accommodate it. I wouldn't take them in unless I actually had the space. Um, and at that point, my collection was rescued. So, I mean, I, did, I wasn't really, I, I didn't need to buy any. Um, but all I was doing was spending money on cages. I was constantly buying cages and, and expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, and I wasn't doing racks at that time. Racks were not really a thing. Everything I had, or, and I still have them as the vision cages. So um, they were really good and easy to sanitize. It was able to, you know, I'm still an avid user of bleach and Dawn soap on inside enclosures. And they, you know, they held up really well. Um, you know, I still had quarantine in my mind on even at that point, but not to the degree I, I think of things these days. Um, where, you know, containment separation and separate rooms or separate, separate buildings. Um, but it was, it was, it was a worthwhile experience because I was able to build relationships with the authorities in the, uh, Chicagoland area. I was able to provide, um, a lot of our users with, um, support, um, because I was learning along the way and I was passing that information on to other people. And what I ended up doing was actually building up a really great network. So <laughs> my, my, my bulldog's there. going through separation anxiety, trying to get in my office. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry. 
now you're good. Uh, but it was it was um it was great. I mean, I you know, I started uh coordinating with Brookfeld Zoo, Lincoln Park Zoo, Shedd Aquarium, um, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. I think we ended up uh building a network of um uh, go to people for different species. And we had um we had that laid out ahead of time and in such a way so that when things came in and we were in a position that we really needed to make sure that um we wanted to get it in the hands of the right people, sort of a final destination. Um, and that way we weren't really necessarily taking the animals in and exposing them to any type of um, contamination or even, as I said, you know, putting it in my hands wasn't great if it was a specialized feeder or something like that. I wanted to get it to somebody who actually had the resources possible. Um, and we did that. And I think um, our organization actually um, built a lot of credibility because of that. Um, and we've sustained that for years. Um, after I stepped away from the adoptions program, the person I mentored uh, continued to do it up until just last year, which is phenomenal because I'm not, I, she never got burned out of it per se. And, but she managed it a lot better so that, um, we had people directed to places that they can uh, bring the animals and, uh, and thankfully, too, the volume really dropped off. Um, you know, I think during that period of time, one of the things that changed was education, like the Internet. Um, people also found that they had, unfortunately, had things like Craigslist and that. But King Snake and other venues for um, people to sell animals or, you know, rehome them somehow. And, you know... I may not be a big fan of some of the distribution channels that we have, but it'll, if we can connect people that are passionate about taking animals in and they do it in an informed way, um, who's to say that, you know, that you can't have that. Um, we just need to be able to make sure that people are doing it properly. Um, the biggest challenge we have, and of course we've seen it evolving over the years is the changing in legislation, the changing in, local county rules and regulations that sometimes are um, are done in an ill-informed way. Um, you know, we, we saw that in Illinois, not, not ill-informed, but we saw that in Illinois where we saw pressure with a lot of confusion with animal control and other um, authorities not understanding um, what was appropriate, to, what was legal to have and what wasn't. And as it turned out, um, we were on the original approach to changing what was called the Illinois Dangerous Animals Act, and then what later um, evolved into the Herpetiles Act in Illinois. And we got that passed um, a couple years ago, and it was kind of a little bit of embracing the trend of, listen, you know, there are some species that not everybody should have. And yet at the same time, too, we wanted to be able to provide a, a sustainable mechanism for responsible ownership. And so that's kind of where we come in with the permitting. Um, you know, you could actually, you could actually get a permit for certain species in Illinois that were previously prohibited like crocodilians. And you, know, you kind of look at that and you're like, really? You know, it's like people don't realize it's like, yeah, so it was illegal regardless. And actually Illinois was even more confusing. It's like under four feet, it was legal. <laughs> they it's grow like, don't they well yeah you know we, you know <laughs> we'll just stick it in the bathtub it won't grow for over four feet right um so we ended up having to deal with that and you know and we've we've seen we've seen the byproduct of that over time i mean we've seen um a reduction in the number of species that were um that are i call it inappropriate for normal people to keep um and yet opened up a pathway for those responsible people that had the means to be able to do it properly. Um, so how know. accessible are those permits? I mean, is it just filling out paperwork or is there some type of hours you need to do? Yeah, it's kind of a combination of a couple of them. Um, so there's got to be, obviously you got to be buying it. Um, I'm sorry. The permit is set up so that, such that you got to be able to demonstrate that there's sort of a community reason why you should be able to own that species. So take crocodilians, for instance. You're going to get a crocodilian because you want to do outreach. You want to do education. It's the only permitted reason unless you're, you know, again, if you're zoological, you're doing outreach and education or scientific. So, uh, you know, if you're just a person who wants to keep an alligator, it's like, we well, got to do something with it. Okay. And 
to that, you have to evidence throughout the year you do. I think it's six events that you have to demonstrate throughout the year. And it has to be validated by whomever you're, you know, doing the outreach with. And to be honest with you, that's kind of where I've seen, you know, the Herb Society is surprisingly got involved because we do a lot of those outreach activities with other organizations. So we've actually, the last couple of years, I've actually been um, issuing um, letters to validate the um, events that these people have, have participated in. And that's not an, that's not something I think we've ever would have thought about before. They would actually get involved in sort of that regulatory part of it. Um, and I think that's probably not unique necessarily to Chicago Herpological Society, but there's probably not many herp societies that are involved in that. You know, you got to have the size, you got to have the, I was sort of the, the credibility and the reputation. Um, and I mean, the fact off the that, top, off the top of my head, I mean, I can only think of a handful of herb societies that are consistently active. Oh, I know, and it's it, it was when I started as president back in the beginning of 2017. I saw the decline of of non for profits and specifically with the, uh, the herb societies, and um, for various reasons, I didn't get the traction that I was hoping for with developing uh, you know, the one of the ideas is to come up with sort of a syndicated type of uh, program where maybe the Chicago Herp Society or a similar large Herp Society could act as sort of a mothership and um, looking at having regional chapters that kind of fall up underneath that. So that way they're not having to worry about the sort of the nuts and bolts of, of running a non-for-profit organization, but they've got the sort of um, um, uh, resources for a larger organization. And I think, you know, we got to look at the potential of that, I think, as things are evolving in society these days is that, um, you know, it takes a lot. I mean, you know, non-for-profits have taken a hit. People don't volunteer as much. Um, money is um, not donated um, to organization as much. And so our need is becoming more and more, and yet the resources to do it are becoming, you know, less and less. So um, as we saw, I mean, we had, you know, we, we rely on our volunteers and you don't realize like the talent and the um, uh, sort of the commitment that these volunteers have to be able to, to do things that um, other organizations don't have the resources for. And, you know, we continue to support our animal control offices because we've got volunteers that have been doing it for decades. And, you know, it's it's one of these ones. It's like what happens when they they move on? you know, or pass on, as we've seen in some cases, um, you know, we, we're worried, we're, you know, the one of the concerns I have is, um, you know, we've collected through the Herp Society, through one individual who's been our resident crocodilian pro, um, and his son, and, you know, we've, we've got a couple other people that, you know, definitely help out, but we've collected probably close to 750, 800 crocodilians over the last few decades. Wow. And we've only had a couple that we couldn't. Uh, Chance the snapper was one of them. Uh, but thankfully he's in St. Augustine. So, you know, we're, we're happy about that. Oh, we just we just got back from going. I'm guessing he's at St. Augustine uh, Alligator Park. Yep, yep. It was actually, I was kind of glad to see that they got involved. But, uh, you know, but it, it does bring up the point. I mean, I've had to do um, wellness assessments with law enforcement. Um, in code enforcement areas, you know, with people with larger collections. And, you know, all it takes is, you know, one sizable collection of exotic animals. And, you know, you have to wonder what's going to happen with the animals. Um, you know, we don't have animal control offices that can handle, I mean, many of them are, are constrained on dealing with, you know, the native wildlife and the dogs and cats. You know, if you've got a situation where somebody's got 50 or 60 boa constrictors, you know, and what happens? You know, I've had to, I've gotten called in to handle a couple of situations where um, an owner, um, you know, did everything by the book, did a great job, and they passed away. And, you know, you've got all these, you know, exotic animals, and, um, you know, the family often doesn't have anything to do with it. And, you know, what do you do when you have to, you know, you got a large collection? Um, you know, I've gotten called in on cases where somebody was terminally ill and they were a herper and they couldn't, you know, for various reasons, they couldn't keep the collection anymore. Um, and a lot of times we get called in too late. A lot of times when we do get called in, the resources to do it properly are, 
are not necessarily there because we're not prepared to be able to deal with a surge like that. Um, and, you know, that's that's just situational issues. What happens when we have something more um, regional, um, like we've seen with Katrina and, with, you know, with the hurricanes in Florida and such, is that you got this large mass of animals being, you know, um, released or, or, or abandoned. Um, and you want to be able to, you know, preserve as many of them as possible. So what do you do? And we don't have answers for that. Um, we could barely do it with the dogs and cats situation. Um, and those of us who have collections that are, that we have maybe the skills and the, the resources to do it, we may not necessarily have the cage space um, or worse yet the time and, you know, the ability to get the animals. So um, I think as keepers, I think we are kind of entering into as a hobby, I guess, in many ways, we're entering into a sort of a new world. Um, and that new world is, you know, exotics are here. Um, we're going to continue to get pressure to have them, but we're getting pressure not only to keep them because of, you know, maybe animal rights reasons, but we also have the practical issue of what do we do when we have national emergencies or regional emergencies where you have to do something with the animals. And, um, you know, I sat in on a, um, graduate level course as a subject matter expert um, recently at one of the major universities in Chicago and it was training emergency response personnel um, for different this then there was representing nationwide and it was talking about specifically about the animal human interactions what do you do with service animals during an evacuation what do you deal with pets what do you and then of course you know they brought they brought me in, I think, mainly to kind of shock and awe people. But they're like, and what do you do when you're like this goofball who's got how many animals you got? Um, and to sit there and say, yeah, what happens if you've got a, you know, a large collection of animals and that area has to be evacuated? Or worse yet, you just have a regional power outage. Um, so, you know, a lot of people probably don't have sophisticated emergency planning. Um and I think that's, you know, when I look at the sort of the next evolution of my my career, um, taking what I've done in the federal sector um, as a contractor is to look at what can we do to help the, uh, the hobbyists and the professional um, breeders and, and other, you know, um, business owners in this space to be able to start planning um, emergencies, you know, and getting ahead of things, you know, how do you do estate planning? You know, you can leave your car in your will. Somebody can turn around and sell it. What happens when you've got, you know, 60 adult blood pythons <laughs> and who knows how many babies, you know, um, you know, and how do you know what they even have, you know, so, you know, keeping clear documentation on the animals you have, making it readily available to, family and and even your spouse and such but you know uh, what happens if you have i don't know you have a flood in your house in the basement for those of us in the midwest you got basements um you have a flood in the basement you got to move all the animals out of the basement um what do you do you know so i mean these are the type of things that i think you know i look at and i kind of like you know people need to start thinking about this stuff because um things are going to happen and every time you know headline news occurs you know we're looking like a bunch of goofballs um sometimes rightfully so because we were we didn't handle it professionally um and yet i've seen the opposite side when something does happen and we step in through the herbs the herb society and it changes the message um all of a sudden it's like oh we got this goofball it's got a bunch of animals too and the chicago herbological society showed up and they took care of matters and we moved on and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, reptile people are, boy, they're sophisticated. You know, um, and really that, I mean, that's, I would, that would be my goal is to see our hobby elevated to the level where people look at us and say, you guys got it under control. You know, we're not a bunch I mean, of, it would be nice. It would be nice to have a network of people that cooperated. Um, it seems like you guys are doing very well in Chicago in comparison to, we're doing better, but I would say we're far from doing well. I mean, we're on a razor's edge. Um, you know, we're always dealing with the risk of, um, you know, I mean, we had to cancel our big fundraiser reptile fest uh, because of the uh, current situation. And, um, 
so survivability of non-for-profits is a big one um the skill and ability of volunteers available to us is another one and you know you know i look at you know i'm not that old but i feel like i'm old <laughs> but if 50 you know 51 almost 52 years old i'm looking it's like you know who's going to replace me in you know say 30 40 years um or people like me who are going to be committed to the cause and are going to be able to do stuff and you kind of have to think about all the steps you know you ask the great question every time you interview your your guests what got you into this okay well the question is going to be what type of answers are you going to get 10 or 15 years from now you know you have to think about that it's like oh yeah i was on snake road i'm like snake road that means you got to go outside you know <laughs> Yeah. It's like if somebody asked me, you know, 20 years from now, it was the same, you know, say same age scenario. They're like, oh, what did you do when you were a kid? And it's like, I, I played video games. You know, um, I sat in front of the TV. You know, I was Netflixing. You know, was, the you know, the you catching know. of the garter snake story is going to fade away eventually. And it, it is for various reasons. You know, they obviously we're encroaching on a lot of habitat. So it's making those op those opportunities um, less and less common. Um we're also seeing the issue is that you know when i was you know 15 years old and you know i was messing around with a copperhead down in southern illinois there was no one there to yell at me and say i was doing something illegal because at the time it probably wasn't they probably didn't even have rules in the books so um yeah there's a lot of a lot of changes occurred in a way that it's not building sort of that um opportunity for our hobby to continue we may be creating new versions. I mean, the podcast is and the YouTubes are great um, because it's getting people exposed to it. But again, uh, having a bunch of people who are you know comfortable at identifying something on a screen versus actually interacting with an animal, you know, and knowing that when you grab a garter snake, you're going to get you know you're <laughs> you're going to get musked, you're going to get bit, you know, and not be afraid of that, you know, um, or actually get excited about it. You know, like this, let's face it, we all got excited. We weren't the other type, right? Um, and then later down the road, you're dealing with other things. And, um, you know, what type of zookeepers are going to be out there specializing with reptiles, um, veterinarians and stuff. And that's, you know, me, I'm thinking about this down the road. It's like, what could we do to help inspire and promote the next generation or two of kids that are coming up? Um to be open-minded and to be adventurous, to be able to go in there. And um, I think that's that's a challenge I think we all, uh, we're all facing, and we also have some opportunity to actually influence. Yeah, I think, I think now we're in the era of uh, deli cup herpers and rack systems. And, you know, when you, when you first, people are now getting into reptiles strictly to breed. I mean, like right off the bat, that's their, that's their idea of what snake keeping is and breeding and stuff like that. When, uh, you know, it goes much further than that. And hopefully people also appreciate that these are, you know, animals from nature and not just a pastel clown, yellow belly pied. So now, there's, you know, there's actually no harm in it either because, I yeah. mean, they're obviously in a, I mean, I would never have thought about breeding um, exotics back when I was a teen um, or even younger. Um, so there's that opportunity that's there. It's, um, and, and to that end of it, I think there's a bit of mainstreaming that opportunity. I, but it seems like every time we take a step forward and expanding the uh, exposure and the knowledge of what reptile and amphibian keeping is like. Um, there's a force working counter to what we're doing for various reasons. Some of them are legitimate, like the um, uh, the risks that we see with aquatics, with uh, invasive aquatic-born animals being introduced or exotic pathogens. Um, you know, we're getting, I guess we're, we're having a better understanding of those things these days or more appreciation. but. You know, the irrational response is still there by certain bodies of, of our community that just feel it's wrong to, to incarcerate and own an animal and and let alone subject it to a captive reproduction. Um, so, yeah, and, and, you know, there's probably some credibility in sort of having this perspective that we could do better 
we can always do better. And we've done strides better than we did 30 years ago. Um, you know, now we're talking more about captive reproduction, selective captive reproduction, um, rather than um, keeping you know, something just, alive. <laughs> well, keep it alive, but more importantly, from an import. I mean, think about, you know, back, the only reason I started breeding ball pythons is because I was looking at the quota numbers. I mean, you're talking a million and a half to two million animals a year um, just out of the, you know, the main countries out of uh, Africa. And, you know, all you, know, you talk to the importers, they're like, oh, yeah, we had a lot of diet, you know, a lot of dead ones coming in. And how many, how many actually made it to survive at a ripe old age? And um, I think one of the best things that actually happened was, in some ways, was the morphs. People started realizing, it's like, wait a minute, I can make more of these really exotic animals by captive breeding them, and it takes a bit of the pressure off of the importation. And at some point, the importation rightfully will probably either come in as a, 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 a trickle or stop altogether. Um, but, you know, when we see that, it's, you know, there's there's kind of a bad side to that, too, because we lose the gene pool. Um, you know, I'm... You know, you look at some of the exotic um, species out of uh, Australia and New Guinea and stuff like that. And it's, you know, some of these, it's like, you know, we're probably never going to get any more than they are in the United States. And we're starting to see with the bearded dragons already with, you know, um, inbreeding, you know, problems. And um, they're never going to look like they do in the wild, um, you know, especially the especially with how we've bred the bearded dragons over how many generations. So um, having loyalty to a locality of bearded dragons, obviously not going to be an issue. <laughs> we're not going to have a choice. We're going to, we're going to end up having either hybridize them or, or do something to, you know, expand the survivability of them. Um, yeah. I know we were talking to Heather Moy and she's actually, you know, hybridizing at this point And it seems like that's kind of uh an unfortunate side effect of uh, the the gene pool, but uh, you know when it comes to the bearded Depends dragon, on who you're yeah. asking, I guess. Yeah, I you know if, if we're if we're Morelia people, we'd be like you know cursing the the hybridization on, in some circles. But um, the reality is, I think the bearded dragon was probably ripe for hybridization, no matter what. Um, it is probably the single most common reptile that's out there, and and it for good reasons and it would be very disappointing to see that end um you know we don't you know green iguanas you know maybe a, a fun animal to look at and everything else and the experience on them you know sometimes could be rewarding but more by and large they're they're not an easy species to keep um for the average person the bearded dragon is easy i'm sorry um you know i bred them for 15 years and you know that was my first lizard I ever bred, and I pretty much didn't do anything right. Um, <laughs> it doesn't take much um, other than paying attention. And, you know, now we've got all sorts of recipes on how to feed them, and we got books on how to keep them. So, um, yeah, it's it's actually – I'm going to echo um, a couple of people I've heard recently and, and say the – take the positive side. This is actually a kind of a good time for reptiles. We're going to have our struggles. It's never going to go away. But we got to look at how much progress we've made and um, how much potential we still have. And uh, and now that everybody's going to be basically stuck at home for the next thirty days, or wherever you're going to be at sixty days, and who who knows at this point, um, we're going to appreciate our collections even more because we get to see them all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, for me as a colubrid person, this is breeding season. This is perfect. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. And for I'm you waiting, guys, I mean, you probably have to... yeah. So, well, I, I keep mm, probably about two dozen different species. So I've got, you know, there's some activity going on all year long. So, um, but yeah, the short tails, yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, I might actually catch an ovulation or two is, since, I'm, <laughs> since I'm home. <laughs> there you go. What other species are you, are you working with besides oh, the python? Um, I've always had a postage stamp collection, but, um, you know, I've always been a monitor guy. So there's always at least a couple of monitors in my collection. Um, I've got a sulcata tortoise that my wife got as a hatchling back in 1995. Um, so we've got a pair of those. So I'm actually in the process of building an indoor enclosure to accommodate 
even when they're mammoth. So I've got a very, oh, yeah. How does that work in Illinois? What's your plan? <laughs> oh, well, I've got a, I've got a design enclosure. It's going to be about seven foot by 20 foot. So that's to the winter accommodation and they're kept outdoors um, uh, during the summer months. So, and they do, they do very well. Um, I've got a couple other, I've got, um, um, I've had Candoia, the ground boas for many years. And, um, I've been focusing on kind of like what's the next species beyond short tail pythons. Not that I will ever move away from the short tails, but I want to get in something different. So um, I started with something uh, else fat. Yeah. They, slow I, mean, metabolism. I just love the way. Yeah. The slow metabolism is the key on them. Um, but I've got Kendoia Pelsoni, the, uh, the Solomon's uh, ground boas and um, playing around with a group of uh, recently born uh captive bred animals I've had the imports to and um, working on different ways of getting them to voluntarily eat on their own. And I think if we can get beyond that initial process, much like the hog, hog nose folks had, if you can get them start feeding on their own, they're actually a really cool snake. Um, their head structure and everything else. And I'm kind of probably will expand into the other Candoia like Aspera and stuff like that. But um, I love them. I, I think, uh, much like retic people kind of go to blood pythons, <laughs> blood python people, I think are drawn to the uh, vipers, uh, the viper bullets. So, uh, and I can't have a viper. So, uh, but yeah, I've got that. Um, I've got, you know, an assortment of different, I've got a couple of boas. Um, I've always had boas um, for the last God knows how long. Um, I've got uh, a green tree python. Um, I always keep one just because I love them, but no interest in breeding them. And then uh, I think outside of that, I've got a bunch of ball pythons. I mean, I think, you know, they'll probably bury me with ball pythons when I die one day because uh, they can never get away from them. <laughs> so, but I uh, got some ball pythons out there pretty old too, but uh, they're, you know, um, so, you know, kind of odd balls and stuff like that. I, um, I'm focusing right now um I'm ramping up with the Argus and the uh, um, the Ackies. So um, I haven't gotten down to the next letter in the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the other ones, but I'm actually looking at potentially breeding them. So um, and that's just I just fascinated with them. So um, I just run into some really weird issues when I you know I acquire animals. So uh, I pick up. Uh, cancers and stuff like that so i've spent more money on veterinary costs just to figure out what the heck is going on with these different species so i've definitely contributed to that body of knowledge um but yeah i that's pretty much it i mean i'm I, like i said my wife has her own little collection so um and she's got uh, crested echoes she's, she's worked in reverse <laughs> she's got an iguana she's got bearded dragon she's got you know crested geckos and the Turkish gecko, and I think we, I think we have a Cuban anole, and I got a, a Niger Euromastix, and she actually m had me get her a boa constrictor for her birthday a couple years ago. So <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on with you? You're, you know, it's like going back in time. You know, it's like not going with more complicated, sophisticated species. We're going back to the basics. Is she so. breeding those as well? No, no. <laughs> I feel like some of those geckos can get out of hand real quick. She keeps them all separate. Uh, even the, the we got two crested geckos, and the female just lays eggs on the side of the cage by the male. <laughs> <laughs> but they're kept separate, so you know. Yeah, I think they're just begging to breed at this point. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, you know it's and we've had spontaneous. I mean, my even. I've got a single Argus monitor I've had for quite a few years. I've always had one. And this last time it was a rescue that I took in and um, she lays eggs for me constantly. And I'm like, eventually I'm like one of these days, maybe I'll, you know, I never, I never get viable eggs. So the parthenogenesis is out of the equation at this stage, unless she spontaneously produces that. Um, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to hatch out some monitors. So closest I'm going to get is probably the Yankees. Um if so do you keep those, uh, you keep those in a group? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well right now I've got them separated only because I had to restart with, um, a new, uh, new male. So I had originally bought a pair, um, and the, uh, female I had at the time started developing some weird, um, growths on the body. And, 
Um, after all the testing and everything else, we figured out it was some um, weird cancer that she was developing. The only thing I suspect is probably, you know, inbreeding depression was probably made her a risk for that. So reached out, ended up getting a female from a more reputable um, source and uh, yeah, did my homework a little bit more about how, how they were raising them and breeding them up. So real, real good on that. Um, but the problem is I have a, the male that was part of the pair that I originally bought is, uh, is not viable either. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I want to get another male, but I'm not in a big rush. So, you know, if I have to start all over with a new group later on down the road, I probably will. Um, if I do that, I might go with Kimberly. So I don't know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how good my, uh, uh, my Python breeding year will be before I dump some money into that project. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And it's, it's awesome to see that. I mean, like you've said, someone who's been doing it for, I think you said three decades earlier when we were talking, you're still experimenting with different species and you're still just as interested as you were, it seems, as uh, when you started. And clearly I'm still making mistakes. So, you know, I felt like <laughs> for all the, the newbies that are out there, it's like, yeah, the, you know, us old timers are still doing bonehead things too. So, um, and, you know, let's face it, um, we're dealing with wild animals and, you know, um, for the most part. So there's a lot of variables that we're working with that probably are working against us in many ways as well. Um, and that's the reason why I think, you know, we need to continue to um, share what our experiences are, share our observations, um, you know, and there's different vehicles for it. Um, you know, the, the fact that I ventured down a, the effort of actually publishing a document and you know, kind of cringing when I finally went to press on that one because, you know, like I still kind of felt that who, why me, why do I think I can, you know, publish something out there? And, um, and I think it was, that was part of the reason why I kind of went the direction I did with that book was just simply to say, you know, the one thing I can honestly attest that I've, I've, am, I can really claim to being good at is having a good passion for it. And, whether I'm right, wrong, or indifferent on my experiences with it, if I give other people a baseline to start with, then they can actually, um, all they could do is improve from that. That's, you know, that was my goal. And uh, um, I know somebody kind of teased me about it when I when I finished the book and they were looking at the last couple of pages and I had feed cards. And I said, well, that's so that they could rip them out. It says, what do you mean rip, rip pages out of a book? You don't do that. I'm like, Sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> now you do. And and the segue into today's environment, if we run out of toilet paper, you can use my book. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, thank you, first of all, so much for being here and being generous <laughs> with your time and getting that information out there. Uh, where can people get in contact with you and also find your book? Well, uh, the book is actually out on Amazon. Um, so it's called A Passionate Journey with Short Tail Pythons. Um, you can also get to a link, um, for my, I've got a website and a Facebook. Um, uh, my website is rich Crowley reptiles, um, .com. And then, um, Facebook, I'm out there under rich Crowley reptiles as well. Um, definitely that's probably between the Facebook and the website website. I don't really add a lot of my, uh, available animals on there cause it's a pain in the butt to keep updated, but, um, you know, I'll be listing things through Morph Market, and I usually have people stalking me anyways um, because they kind of know I don't advertise everything I produce. Um, but, yeah, uh, through Amazon. And, I, you know, if I think if you search anything on the Rich Crowley Reptiles, um, I, there, there isn't another Rich Crowley Reptiles out there, so that helps. <laughs> There you go. And as for me, you want to check out PortCityPythons.com, PortCityPet.com, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. This is From the Ground Up Podcast. Rich, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. Hey, you guys take care. I'll catch you guys next week. All right.